I want to ask you what you would do if God brought about an amazing blessing in your life. What would you do if you were in a situation where defeat seemed inevitable and God shows up and turns it around? There's moments that we all face in this life when we just feel like, you know, Lord, if you could just take me to heaven now, because I am just so done with this, that would be a blessing to me. We have those moments, and it's not new. If you remember Psalm 23, thousands of years ago, a guy was writing about being led through the valley of the shadow of death. So if you think that your life is unique and you're the first one to go through hard times, it's because... As Americans, we have a pretty big ego, and we always think life is about us. But the truth is, you're not the first one to have a hard time. Amen. And we know what that's like to really feel, not that this is just a valley of difficulties, but that this is a valley of death, that we will not survive through this storm to come out the other side, right? If you've ever had that, if you've ever had those moments when all of a sudden God just finally provided that, that... Um, job that you needed or that diagnosis where you were just praying and you were so worried and so concerned and God provided there or that moment when you, you your marriage was crumbling and God did something there or whatever it is we have a lot of different things that if we actually took the time we could think about it by the way if you don't study for your test and then you don't fail the test it's not exactly like a miracle of Jesus like you know turning a water into wine you know and God is not in the business of 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 Blessing laziness, you know. Well, I was up late last night watching a movie, so I didn't study for my test. Oh, Lord Jesus, come here now. Send an angel to give me all of the answers. You're still going to be waiting at the end of that, by the way. Chances are, if God did something like that, you'd be happy, right? Anybody here wouldn't be happy if God provided something good? We would be happy, Right? Right? We would be happy, we would be excited, and we would uh, be really, really grateful, and we would tell God all these things that we would do for him, and then we would move on. Right? We don't even keep our New Year's resolutions to ourselves, much less any resolution we ever make to the Lord. Lord, if you will do this for me, I will read my Bible every day, and I will stop gossiping about the person who's over here. Sure. All right. And then the next day, you're like, oh, I'm really tired. I'm gonna, I'll read my Bible when I get home from work, and I'm really tired when I go. I'll read my Bible the next day. And Lord, I will read my Bible next year, I promise you that. Something's different about this Feast of Purim. See, a lot of us, nothing changes after God does something good in our life, right? You know what's remarkable to me about Scripture is how the sinful nature is the same generation after generation after generation after generation. People in church grumble and complain. The people of God grumble and complain, and we look like idiots while we do it. You have God bringing over a million people out of slavery, leading them in the day with a pillar of cloud and leading them at night with a pillar of fire. And he leads them to the point of the Red Sea and the enemy is behind them and gathering closer. And then what does God do? He parts the Red Sea. Moses doesn't part it. Moses just holds up his stick as a sign so everybody can see it. But God parts the water, sucks out so much moisture and evaporation. It doesn't say they trudge through the mud. It says they walk through on dry ground. They go through. God has barred the, the, uh, the Egyptian army with a cloud of, uh, with, with the pillar of fire. Then he moves it. They rush into the waters. The army comes, the water comes down and destroys the army. And the very next thing it records the people of Israel wanting to do is kill Moses because they're thirsty. 
And they literally say, can we go back to Egypt where we had all of the food we could ever want? For one, I'm not quite sure that you're looking at things accurately. Slavery is not known for the buffet table. But in the midst of their hunger and in the midst of their thirst, they want to kill the prophet of God. They grumble. They complain. Because it seems like that's what the people of God do. And then God provides manna. And they complain about the manna. Lord, we are a people who want diversity. We are a people who want variety. We don't go to McDonald's every day. We want to go to other places, Lord. And we want to kill Moses now because they have gotten tired of these heavenly wafers. So God says, and I love God's response in this. I will send you so much meat you will vomit it up. And he does. He sends them so much quail that they literally cannot stand it anymore. And then he says, you, are you done complaining? Guess what? They weren't because they were still alive. And as long as they had a heartbeat, they had a complaint to utter about something. And God goes up into the presence, the actual manifested presence of God, the Shekinah glory on top of Mount Sinai, and the people go, let's have an orgy. And they make a golden calf and have an orgy. What I'm trying to say here is that it is something within us and our sinful nature that no matter how many blessings we get from God, our response is to forget it and complain. Forget it and gripe. Do you really think that the Lord Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead, that you can have a new life so that you can point out every single flaw of everybody in church? Or you can grumble and complain about the colors or about what the pastor wore that day or the pastor's fantastic haircut or the pastor's not-so-fantastic haircut. The songs that were chosen, well, if they really loved Jesus, they would have sang that third verse. As we all know, Jesus didn't write the first verse. He wrote the third verse that we skipped on that hymn, Right? Because it's not about us, but we think it is. So nothing changes in us. Nothing is different in us, but there is something different in the Feast of Purim. You see, a divine intervention had happened. All of the Jews of the Persian Empire were at the point where a genocide was about to take place because one of the king's top advisors, Haman, came up with this plot to kill all of the Jews. His beef was racial. It had gone back for generations and generations, and he hated the Jews. And finally, he was in a position to try to kill all of the Jews. And because Esther was bold enough and courageous enough, because Esther fasted and prayed, she had the boldness, she had the courage, and God delivered the Jewish people from Haman. And not only did Haman die, it ended up being an event where all throughout the Persian Empire, the Jews got permission to kill those who were trying to harass them and kill them and destroy their lives anyway, regardless of Haman. And so it became a day of deliverance. It became a day of deliverance that they were supposed to remember. And how did they respond to this miraculous and amazing event? They made the word we hate. They made a tradition. They made a tradition. A tradition. I know. I know. Can you believe that they bothered to make a tradition? Don't they know that traditions are just old? Traditions are just pointless. That traditions, oh my goodness, we have to do this again. That's the way I feel sometimes about Christmas. Like, oh my goodness. <sighs> I just want to sing. I just want to talk about. I just want to tell the story of Jesus. I don't want to have to wake up at five in the morning and, and then my mom makes like a thousand pecan pies and I'm addicted to pecan pies. And so then I'm like, I feel so bad. I just keep feeling worse as I'm chugging my face full of those pecan pies. It was just, can we just 
stop. But that's tradition. And that's what we think of sometimes when we think of traditions, right? We just think of things that we do because we do them and we don't have a reason for doing them. We just do them that way, right? Right? I mean, why do we, why do we sing this number of songs? Because this is the number of songs that we sing. I mean, I've known churches that split over changing out the pews. It's not like Jesus ever had a pew to sit on, right? And he didn't have these chairs either. You know how the original church worshiped? You stood the entire time. Your preacher better not be Brandon Powell because you would get tired by the time he's done. Like, 30 second, 30 second sermon, pastor. 30 second sermon. Come on, I've been standing for 45 minutes here. Let's get this done. But it's tradition, right? We, whatever area we grew up in, whatever we grew up in, we think of rigidity. When it comes to tradition, we think that's negative. We think of something that's probably out of touch. We think that we think of a series of actions that have lost its meaning, something that we do for tradition's sake, and no one understands it anymore. But for the Jews, this tradition was not just because they had an empty space on their calendar. It was an act of worship to God. And there's really three elements of the Feast of Purim. The first thing is to present the story. Why? Because you have babies getting born. And you have people joining the flock who didn't know the story beforehand. And you've also had a lot of stuff that has happened over the last year. And so we're not going to take the chance that Kelly and Brandon and Rusty and Carolyn are all going to teach their children about the, this story. We're going to come together as a community. We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a celebration. We're going to retell what happened. So all of the believers, all the Jewish uh, people at this time would gather together in their local community, either in their home or the synagogue or wherever it is, and they'd gather together and they'd tell the story again. And they do basically like we do with our Christmas plays. You get a bunch of kids, you tell them the lines, they forget the lines, but we just keep moving on and the story gets told. They, they, they've done that for over 2,000 years. They have done children's plays. They reenact it. And, you know, I don't know if it's the guy that was the, the kid that's been missing all the practices that gets to be Haman or what it is. Uh, maybe the one that gets the most uh, trouble at school gets to be Haman. I don't know. They reenact it. Imagine this. Just imagine this scene. They gather all of the generations together, all of the generations together. Imagine the little kids sitting on their parents' knees hearing the story. Imagine the parts that are call and response and everybody's getting into it. Imagine as they're sitting there and -and so-and-so's grandma is watching her grandchild reenact the story and she remembers when she was a child and she participated in the story too. Imagine how much that would mean. And more than that, Imagine how much it would pour that story into your memory that this is something that you don't forget. The second part of this is to party. To have a feast. Oh my goodness, no one is celebrated about partying. We're Nazarenes, man. Wherever we are gathered, there's the Holy Spirit and food. Somewhere there is food when Nazarenes get together. Like, there's something in our DNA that has decided you cannot worship the Lord on an even slightly empty stomach. We must have food at everything, right? They, they, they feast. Why? Because the bonds of the people were almost wiped out of the history of the earth. The bloodline was almost destroyed. So every year they come together and they feast. And you know what happens when you sit down and eat with somebody? You begin to form a bond. So the bonds that were almost destroyed are rekindled every single year. New bonds are made every year. You get to sit there next to people and you just eat and you just talk and you just celebrate. You relax. 
You get revived in your own heart, in your own spirit. You're singing songs together. You're having a celebration together. The people that were almost destroyed by Haman every year make sure that they rekindle the bonds of family and community because they almost lost their family and they almost lost their community. And then the third element is this. They pass it on. As we read in the scriptures, every year they make gifts of food And they give gifts to the poor. Now, by the way, one of the traditional foods for the Feast of Purim are little triangle desserts that are... For some reason, the tradition says Haman had a triangle hat on, so they they celebrate him by eating his hat. I don't know. uh, But anything that's pastry is good with me. I don't care what the reason is. So they pass it on. They give all these triangle-shaped cookies to people. They go up into the the poor people in their community and to their neighborhood. Even if they're not Jewish, they go to the poor and they give them gifts. They celebrate what God did for them by doing for others. Isn't that remarkable? The only reason that's remarkable is because we see it so rarely. God did something for them, so they do something for somebody else. And so every year, do you know what happens? Somebody goes, that Brandon and Lydia clearly are crazy. They're having another child. They need help. So I'm going to go up to their house, and I'm going to knock on their door, and I'm going to stand there with a bag of diapers, and they're going to say, who are you, strange person, with this bag of diapers? And I like, well, let me tell you. I'm giving you this bag of diapers because the Lord delivered us from genocide. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly how the conversation takes place, but what I do know is that the story doesn't get told just in the Jewish community, but they give the gifts to the poor and tell them the story of God. Why? Why? Because that's what we want to know, right? We don't just care about actions. We want to know why is this being done. And so they do that. And this whole Feast of Purim is really about one thing. Embedding in the memories and into the lives of the people the good that God has done for them. The story of God's deliverance in their lives. Now, I want you to think about your own life. Think about an important event in your life, and imagine if you did the same thing that the, that the Feast of Purim is about. Imagine if you thought, you think about your wedding anniversary. Hopefully that's a pleasant memory. Think about, your, think about when you got married. Think about how you could present the story. You could gather all of your family around and you could invite them over for a big dinner and you could tell them the story of how you two met, of how you two grew in love together and and how you decided to commit your lives to one another. You could tell not just your children and grandchildren the story. You could invite friends and coworkers and whatever else over. And hey, if there's food, you can invite your pastor over because he likes to eat too. And I'd love to hear your story as long as there's food involved, right? Man, y'all are really quiet today. You could throw a party. You could tell the story. And then you could repay the blessing. You could take a young couple that you know, and you could invite them over. You could give them some gifts, and then you could just sit there and tell them. You could tell them. Build that bond so that they have somebody to turn to when it does get hard. Or think about another important event in your life. Anybody ever had an appendectomy? Hey, invite everybody over to celebrate the anniversary of your appendectomy. (laughs) The anniversary of that time when they ripped your appendix out of your body. And then you could get all your kids and grandkids and they could reenact it. 
You just strip off your shirt and they can just pretend they're ripping out your appendix out of you. And then you could have appendix-shaped cookies that you give to everybody and go door to door giving, a, giving cookies in the shape of your appendix and telling everyone about that time your appendix burst, right? Does that sound like a good idea? Any volunteers? Really, all joking aside, the Feast of Forum is not a celebration of human achievement. It is a celebration of divine intervention. It is a celebration of God, God doing what man could not do and changing history. What do we usually do to celebrate God's victories in our lives? Usually, nothing. Or we do something really stupid. I knew someone who got a big, uh, they got paid back past workers comp. They were at that point where they were about to lose everything. And all of a sudden, God provided and showed up. And so the first thing that they did was they bought a brand new truck and a big screen TV. Because obviously, they didn't learn the lesson that hard times are, are guaranteed, you know, that, that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So at least if I lose my house, I can watch my big giant TV while that happens. That's what we do, right? God gives us a job, and what do we do? We go buy something for ourselves. God, God uh, 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 saves you from a heart attack, and within six months, you are eating the same way that you were eating before. Imagine if every anniversary of your first, the first time where you cried out to God and you repented of your sins and you felt the relief that came when the guilt and the shame were removed from your life. Imagine if the anniversary every year of that occasion, you gathered people around you and you told them the story of what God had done for you. Imagine if you gathered your family together for a meal and your co-workers and your friends and you told them about the time that you thought you were just going to die in this wilderness. And God finally brought you out and into the promised land. One of my favorite uh, preachers tells a story often of when he was 17 and he had tried to kill himself when he was in the hospital recovery. And somebody gave him a Bible. And his life began to change from that moment. And so you know what he does? He doesn't keep that story a secret. Everywhere he goes, he tells the story of when he had such little hope that he tried to end it all. And now his grandchildren know the story of when God met him in a hospital room in Delhi, India. Imagine if you brought everybody to a party and when they asked you, why are we getting together? It's not because of the Cowboys. It's not because of whatever your favorite sports thing is. It's because I'm celebrating the memory of when God took my messed up life and made me whole. And then you passed it on. Imagine if the anniversary of your salvation, you found someone who you knew was in need, and your response was to help them out. You know, I'm paying your water bill this month because God has given me more than I've ever deserved. And I want to tell you specifically one thing that God did in my life that made a difference. 
hey, I'm buying you groceries this week. <laughs> because not only have, have God, has God provided me with physical food, but he's provided me with the sustenance my soul needs. He's the one that keeps me going. And I know right now you feel like you don't know how you're going to keep going. But let me tell you, I know from personal experience what it's like that the only way I took another step forward is because God. I couldn't do it on my own. Imagine if we responded the way the Bible calls us to respond when God does something good. Raise your hand if you're married. Everybody just raise their hand has argued at least once, I guarantee you. Some of y'all have had some really hard times in your marriages. Most of us, we get married and we're like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. She talks back a lot more than I thought they did in the movies. <laughs> Those old Disney movies, that never happened in the old Disney movies. Snow White never once argued with the prince. So imagine if once a year you gathered a young couple and you took them out to eat and you just said, look, I want to tell you about the time that we, we, we actually uttered the word divorce. And I want to tell you what that's like. And I want to tell you what it's like when you've finally gotten to the end and you realize that you can do no more and you cried out to God and God changed what you could not. Imagine the difference that might make in that young couple. What about the time that you got the job that you were so desperate to get? Imagine if you took somebody else aside and, and you took a young person and you took them out to eat or you took anybody, it doesn't really matter what age, you took somebody, you took them out to eat, you celebrated with them, and they said, why are we doing this? Well, I just want to tell you about the time that God provided for me financially, because I want you to know that this road is not easy, that God doesn't promise it will be easy. God actually says, in this life, you will have trials and tribulations. Your life's going to be hard. But I want to tell you not about an easy time in my life, but I want to tell you about the time that it was so hard. And God showed up. Imagine the difference that this could make, not only in your family, in your neighborhood, among your coworkers, among the other parents in, in PTA or whatever they have now. Imagine the difference this could make in more lives than just your own. But for some reason, we're all sitting back waiting for someone to come up and ask us about it. Well, I keep waiting for my kids to ask me about the time I got saved so I can tell them it. Your children are never going to come up to you and say, hey, tell me the story of when you met Jesus. Seriously. My, my three-year-old has never asked me about that. My three-year-old asked me when we're going to eat, and he just ate. You think your children are going to run up to you and say, give me all of your spiritual wisdom? No. They're not going to do that. For one, because of their sinful nature, they don't think they need to know those things. And if you've never shared with them about the time your marriage was in trouble, why would they ever come up and ask that? That's going to be a little bit awkward, right? Hey, do you, did you and mom ever hate each other? Did you ever wake up and she had a frying pan in her hand and you weren't sure if it was... You know, I really weren't sure what the purpose of that frying pan was. Did you ever have a time where not only did you sleep on the couch, but you kind of kind of disappeared for a couple of days to get some air? Why would your kids ask you that? And if you have been through divorce, maybe you can tell them about how God can heal the broken, the, the shattered hearts that we have sometimes but we don't tell those stories or the time we all have one of those times where we almost died and didn't die right I mean I shot myself in the head people I mean I still got a bullet in my skull on accident I want to tell my children that all the time <laughs> like I know you have a hard head because you have my head my head stopped a bullet You have to tell your children these stories. 
You've got to gather the people together, not just your family, but you have got to begin to realize that we are not called in this life to just focus on our own little bubble. Scripture says that God called the Jewish people the, the, to be the chosen people, and they were chosen for one reason, that they could be a light to the Gentiles, which is everybody who's not Jewish. So their whole purpose in life was not to just have a, a tight family, but that the love of God would be known throughout the whole world because of them and their testimony. We have children who are lost, we have neighbors who are lost, we have co-workers who are lost, and they will never come up and ask us our story. But maybe we can invite them over and have a meal and say, you know, this is the anniversary of something that was really big in my life. I want to tell you about it. It doesn't have to be an hour. It can be five minutes. It can be three minutes. You can write it down beforehand. You know, you can... You can just do whatever presentation you need or you want to do, but God does not call us to keep our stories to ourselves, because our stories aren't about us, are they? They're about God. They're about God. And the Jewish people knew that every generation needs to know that no matter how dark this world is, God's not done. And they need to know about the time that they almost died. And God delivered the whole nation, even in the midst of captivity. He delivered them from genocide. Every generation needs to know that because every generation is going to have moments when it just feels too hard to go on. But I can remember that God is the God of Purim. Surely God can be the God of right now, too. You are cheating and robbing generation after generation because you kept your stories to yourself. Why? Maybe it's because we're really not that grateful after all. Maybe we just really aren't that grateful for all that God died for. Maybe Jesus, the perfect King of heaven, dying on a cross after horrible torture, maybe I'm just really not that thankful after all for what he's done for me. When you look at your children, them saying thanks and then doing the same thing over again would not make you feel grateful, would it? Right? So why do we think that God is pleased with us when we continue the same pattern year after year after year? Would he think that we're grateful? Most of us, according to the polls, most people in church cannot say that they have told their testimony to anybody in over a year. I'm so grateful for all that God has done, I have not told anybody about what that was. That doesn't sound like gratitude to me. So maybe that's one of the reasons we're starting to experience less blessings. Maybe that's one of the reasons why we're starting to experience the presence of God less and less. Maybe that's one of the reasons why we're starting to hear his voice. And the gap between the times when we hear God just seems to grow and grow and grow. Because when we do encounter God, we just turn around and we keep it a secret. We'll talk to our coworkers about Dallas Cowboys and all the interceptions Tony Romo threw throughout his career. Too many for me to count. But we won't just tell them about the most important thing that's ever happened in our life. Maybe we're just not grateful after all. Because if we were, 
Imagine the change that God could do if we told the story, celebrated, and passed it on to others. Things could change.